Hey, bro, let's get into this thing. It's Demasi and Michael just talking tech. Oh, Google Meet. Forgot about you, Google Meet. So when I was setting up my Mac, I decided to use Homebrew's bundler file capability. Basically, it lets you create a file with all the stuff that you want to install. And then it will, when you install Homebrew, you just run brew file, uh, whatever the hell the command is. I don't remember the command right now. We'll link to the documentation in the show notes at your own pay.com slash DM 53. Yeah, it is 53. Uh, yep. <laughs> but basically, you dump all that stuff in there, and then when you run the command to install, it just loops through that file and installs everything you have. And I had to have Homebrew installed anyway to set up my uh, development environment for WordPress. So made sense. I was like, well, huh, I can just use this and have it go install Fantastical and Text Expander and 1Password and you know, audio hijack and all of that stuff, uh, including Reaper. Now, what I have been doing because I'm forgetful is when an app pops up and says, you know, loopback or audio hijack has an update. I just run the updater from within the app. I could go into the terminal and type brew cask up date, I think, or upgrade and then app name and then it'll go out and fetch it and download it and do all of that. I tend not to usually do that because I forget. But recently, because there was an update for Reaper hanging out there that I had not done, because every time I needed to use, you know, every time it popped up and said update, I was actually opening Reaper and I needed to do something like record a show or edit the show. I was like, I don't have time for your updates. (laughs) So what I did eventually, and it was more on accident, was I ran through and ran brew update because I hadn't ran the update command for homebrew itself in a while. And then I hit brew upgrade, which makes brew go through and up update all of the packages that it has installed mm-hmm. including the apps that i had installed well reaper got its update then and what i think may have happened is that homebrew deleted some file probably not an important file but some file uh related to the installation when it installed uh the new version of reaper because when i open up reaper and this is recent. Like this ha- just happened today. Uh, an update happened for me a few days ago. Uh, since I edited DM fifty two a little bit, I go in, I hit Command T to make a new track, I type in the track name, and then I start erroring around, and I get nothing in that little uh, view over there where the tracks show up. Uh, I don't know the official name of that thing, but you know, uh, I don't know how that's weird. Well, the track is created. I can see the track, but it's not moving. So I think. Asura has gotten screwed up somewhere yep. with this homebrew installation, and I have not went and downloaded Asura because I just noticed it uh, to reinstall it. So that is what I think I'm going to have to do to get Reaper back into its functioning state. So, and then there's also a setting somewhere in Reaper that will let you reset Reaper to default. Yeah, hopefully I won't have to go there. I'm thinking because it seems to be an accessibility layer issue. I'm thinking it's just that Asura got got. Uh, zapped some kind of way uh, which means I'm going to have to just you know go download Osra which there could possibly be an update for Osra anyway I wish there was an auto update or some kind of feed I could subscribe to for <laughs> Osra so I'll know when there's new updates isn't it updated on GitHub it is. or hosted on GitHub it is hosted on GitHub uh, and I think I may have subscribed to Git release updates uh but he's not actually doing releases though he's just dropping a snapshot out i have to go look at the actual repo and see how it's structured speaking of github so did you hear the latest as of time of recording would have been recorded on august 2nd no silicast i think i did the one about the book the yeah taming the terminal book taming the terminal book and I'm I'm excited. I need to go grab that because that is super cool. I've listened to some of the uh, episodes. I don't know if you have, but I'm I'm thinking of. Well, actually, I know you have because you were the one who told me to go listen to them. Uh, I'm thinking about grabbing the book though because I think having all that information in one place will definitely be helpful. And guess what? I'll probably grab it from GitHub. Yeah, I've been meaning to go check that uh, check that repo out since I heard it, but I have not gotten it yet. Uh, but I will get it. 
pretty cool project. I will link to uh, her post about it in the show notes. But yeah, cool, cool idea uh, on what they did. And then that is one of the things. So the way that they used GitHub to build this book is uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm sort of surprised. Well, I'm not really surprised. I was intrigued to discover that they did not take the route of using Git book, which is a uh, version control system based off Git, but it's really designed like the feature sets of it and the layout is really designed to write a book. Now, the possibility also exists that the reason nobody is really using this and talking too much about it is because Git book isn't 100. Like it doesn't have the same free capabilities the last time I looked at it uh, that GitHub offers you. So with GitHub now and for about the past year, year and a half, you have free private repositories on github you used to only get private repositories if you were a paying customer which i have been for about three years now but you now get free private repositories uh with github uh which is a feature that a lot of people loved about bitbucket and why a lot of people may have used big bit bucket over github uh i found bitbucket to be annoying uh with its layout and its you know goofiness uh but yeah, I, I thought the project was interesting. I have actually considered. So another place that uses GitHub and you don't hear much about it. You you may read about it in an occasional article uh, is MacStories.net. They use GitHub for all of their articles. Uh, ah. And the way that they go about managing that is each writer or author at MacStories has their own Git repo. And they invite the people to it that need to, uh, you know, see the article that they're working on or whatever and be able to edit or provide comments. Right. But they're tracking the changes to their article as well as the comments and suggestions all through Git, which I find very fascinating uh, because essentially all GitHub is, it sounds extremely complicated when people talk about it. And some people out there even try to make it sound super complicated and all, you know, heavy developer you know, is DevOps. And man, all it is is a bunch of text files. And when you make the change, when you commit, that's like hitting save in a document. Uh, so you <laughs> could, you could version control just about anything that is text. Uh, it gets a little weird when you start getting into like media files and things like that, but just straight text because it's all code is it's just straight text. Like it. Right. So, uh, and I'm actually using GitHub. Uh, one of the, you know, interesting, well, maybe not interesting to anybody but me because I like it. Uh, but one way that I have been using Git for about a year now is to keep version control of my, uh, my RSS feeds. So I was just dump the XML file or the, old, yeah, XML file, whatever it is, OPML file, uh, out of yeah, my OPML. reader and, uh, every few months or so, uh, if I've made any changes, added a feed or removed the feed, I will uh, update that in GitHub. And when I commit, I just write the commit message as, you know, whatever the date is, you know, podcast changes uh, or uh, RSS changes. I'm also doing the same thing with my uh, podcast file in, uh, that's in currently in Overcast. Uh, but I just dump that file and do the same thing. And the reason is because occasionally I have done this to myself where I will go blow away everything like, oh, man, fuck all these podcasts. I don't want to listen. I just delete a whole bunch of crap. Mm-hmm. It's like, man, what happened to that one show that I was listening to or it had an episode that I needed to hear and I don't remember the name of the show and nobody else remembers, even somebody who recommended me to them. I'm like, oh, I don't quite remember. It's like, oh, shit. Uh, so that's one reason. Also, it means that I don't necessarily have to do the whole dance of export this file, copy it here, do this at the time that I want to change to a different podcast player uh, or mm. update my co- podcast. If I'm, you know, playing with the Android phone and, and pocket cast is like, well, I can keep all of those things uh, version. So if I add a new show, uh, I make a commit and then I can just pull that file from anywhere uh, and add it to a podcast for you. I've really been intrigued by the idea of doing articles. Uh, and there's actually a play. Like- Show like show notes for a DM show, maybe yeah, that's possible. See, I didn't think about that. That's actually not what I did not think about. Uh, <laughs> but but that could work because there is a WordPress plugin that I have not played with uh, very much that will uh, keep track of changes to your your posts in, in WordPress. Uh, 
mm-hmm. and, and get. And to me, it's an interesting way to work because one, it means if somebody goes in and makes a change and then breaks something, it's like, well, it's a little easier to go back to where it was because you don't have to remember what did I change? You know, what did I drop into right. this, this, this block of text here that made the format go all weird and reverse itself or whatever. And I think it's just a cool way to work because it gives me, gives you a lot of flexibility in how you do things. So one, one potential way that I have thought of using it, uh, you'll probably know why I haven't ever brought this up, but one way I've thought of using it is for, you know, uh, like pages for stuff on or, you know, documentation contracts for stuff with uh, BES because mm-hmm. put it in Git and well, I can pull my version. If I make an edit, I can push it back and then, you know, you go through the whole the one thing and the one reason a lot of people use GitHub in specific uh, in particular and also some of the other Git hosting services like Bitbucket and GitLab is not only does it keep your work on the version control, but it also means that you can collaborate very easily with people just by inviting them to the repo and you can put rules in place. So, you know, Michael can push to the testing branch over here, but he cannot push to the primary, you know, the master branch, the main branch uh, at all ah. because he could overwrite the, the the production work. Right. I don't want Mike screwing up the production. So we're going to keep <laughs> Mike from manually pushing. But what, what Mike can do is open up what's called a pull request, which means, hey, I've, you know, edited some things and made some changes here. Here's what I did. Uh, review these and then I get the option to merge those into the main branch, uh, you know, once they've been reviewed. So it's a lot of cool things like that that you can do with Git. Maybe we will have to think about playing with that for show notes because uh, follow up to DM52, like that transition there. Uh, I took the podcast content itself and I got lazy with the show notes. Did you take a look at them? Uh, I did not, and I was supposed to. I told you the other day I was going to look at it because I needed to look for some particular yeah. reason. It wasn't even to check out what you did. It was just like, oh, I've got to go look in there for something uh, to see if it's there. But yeah, you told me you were do going you, to, do you, to use... Do you even remember what you were going to go look up? I have no idea. I don't even... Okay, we were, we were talking about moving... We'll, we'll be transparent. We were talking about moving the form uh, so more ah. people will subscribe because we posted on Blind Bargains. Uh, so thank you to all those listeners who came over from Blind Bargains. And, and I mean all of those listeners that came over from Blind Bargains. I I remember now why I pay $5 to advertise on there. Uh, anyways, so we've gathered a couple of subscribers. And on the edit box at youronpay.com where you can subscribe, it is not... Very, it doesn't stand out very well, especially to screen readers. And uh, so we were going to talk about moving that up further into the show notes. Page. That's what it was. Yep. So, anyways, I got lazy with the show notes. Uh, so what I did is I dropped the episode into Alphonic when we got it, and I didn't even listen to it. When you finish editing it, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to go drop it in Alphonic. Next time I probably will, because I don't know if you accidentally did this or just didn't even think about it, but we had no audio imaging in last week's ep- or two weeks ago's episode, ah, DM52. Because you were supposed um, to add it, because I was like, Mike, did you already have a template set up in Alphonic oh, with the audio? And you're like, yeah. I was like, okay, well, that means I don't have to go create it. When I'm done editing <laughs> I will uh, render the file out so you can grab it and then go do your thing and put the audio on it. Ah, confusion. Anyways, so what I did is I took the audio and I threw it into Alphonic and I processed it apparently without my template because I didn't even think about it. And I ran it through Amazon and I took the transcript of that and just used that as the show notes. Um, And... So, yeah, with the uh, either this 53 show notes or one coming up in the near future, we should experiment with Git to play around with that. Yeah, Git, Git is a uh, fascinating, it's, uh, well, I mean, it's a very utilitarian thing. Like, I, I have found it extremely useful in a few times getting myself out of trouble. Uh, mm Because I did something and then it's like, oh, man, I have no idea what I did. Uh <laughs> So, yeah, they, they did this so, book through GitHub, which is an interesting way to work on it because it means everybody can, you know, kind of share around. And instead of making changes directly to what would be considered the the master document, uh, you can branch off and say, well, hey, let's try it. What if we did this? What if we did that? And then merge those changes back in as you, you know, like them or agree with them or approve them. 
So I have one piece I want to follow up with DM52. Uh, well, I guess two things. Number one, uh, DM54, I promise I'm going to have a substantially better microphone. i got to go get one. I just haven't done it yet, but it will happen. Uh, the other thing that I want to follow up with is UB keys. Uh, I've been using them. Those who don't know, I recently got a job, and we're using UB keys for a couple of different systems that we have to log into. For someone who doesn't know, a UB key is an item that you can use. Uh, these ones plug in via USB. I think, Demasi, you said they make Bluetooth ones too? Uh YubiKey, the comp so YubiKey is the company that makes a security makes a bunch of security keys. Uh, oh. They don't make any themselves. Yeah, it's kind of like Google or Kleenex. Like you know, security <laughs> keys have been synonymous has become synonymous with the word YubiKey, which is actually a company that manufactures YubiKeys. There are other companies that make them uh, as well. YubiKey is the one you tend to hear about because they have a ton of uh, security. Uh, and encryption and, and compliance is that they meet. So it makes it an easy choice for people to pick up. Uh, they themselves, as far as I know off the top of my head, do not have a Bluetooth version. Uh, there are other companies that make Bluetooth versions of security keys. Uh, and your phone can also be a Bluetooth security key in certain scenarios. So the one that I have, and, and it's a little tiny key like thing that's, I even have on my keychain that I plug into the USB port for my work computer. And when we log into a system, we enter our password and then it says verify your security key. And I press the little, uh, well, I kind of put my finger in on the little button on the top. Uh, you don't even really have to press it. You do a little, but anyways, when, when it acknowledges it, then it logs you in and it's a simple seamless process and i wanted to follow up with it because we kind of talked about 2fa with one password and using one password for your system to uh process those 2fa inputs but i i really like this physical item aspect number one because it separates that two factor and mm -hmm. number two it's it's kind of fancy it's like kind of cool and i i feel all sophisticated with it now do most of your sites that support 2FA, like that one password could use, do they work with those or do they have to specifically accept the USB model? Uh, so they, a, a site does have to uh, implement YubiKey uh, or security key uh, authentication and the standard that governs that is what well, is a couple now yeah so web auth is the most current uh standard that is compliant with security keys uh and a few other things uh biometric authentication as well but the original uh and the thing that you're really going to be looking for is u2f support uh, or FIDO too, okay. uh, is what it's sometimes referred to as well. So if it has FIDO support or U2F support uh, or web authentic support, either one of those three of those things, which are different versions of a similar standard. But uh, the story behind that is long. I will link to uh, a fairly quick read of, of kind of an overview of these things in the, in the show notes. Uh, but as long as they support one of those things, then you can use a security key. Uh, with the site there are not okay uh so every place that offers two factor does not offer uh fido or u2f support uh they most of them are doing the time-based passwords or totp uh passwords now with yubikeys specifically and i don't know this to be true for any other keys but with yubikeys specifically uh, with the model that I have, which is the five NFC. So it's like series five and then the NFC version. So it also has NFC in it. Uh, but when any of their series five models that are out, uh, which is probably what you have, Mike, I would think. Um, but with definitely any of the series five, maybe some of their series four keys as well, but definitely with the series five Yuba keys, uh, all of them have the ability to store TOTP codes on your key. Uh, so to kind of walk you through what that looks like is they have an app for iOS or they have an app for just about every platform. I'm not certain about Linux, <laughs> uh, but it is on iOS, Android, uh, Windows and Mac OS. What you do, let's say you're setting up an, a, a website that doesn't have uh, FIDO 2 support. 
So you just have to use the regular time-based code. Well, instead of using Google Authenticator or something like that, you will whip out your phone and scan the code uh, using the YubiKey authentication app, Authenticator app. So I have done this for a couple of sites. And here, here's what the process is like because it, it gets weird. I have the, the five NFC key because uh, at the time that I purchased my first key, they did not have one that had lightning. Uh, and I decided when I bought the updated key, not to get the version that had lightning that is out there because it also has USB-C on the other end. And I did not want to deal with the ah. issue of an adapter when I need to plug into the computer, but it works <laughs> on my phones. It's like, that's a little stupid. So the version I have is just regular USB, which also has NFC. That means I can tap it against the back of my iPhone or the back of my Android phone to either serve as the security key method that Mike was talking about where you just tap the button, except you don't really have to tap the button on mobile. Uh, or to store or retrieve a six digit two factor code that's been stored in the key. So with the YubiKey manager, uh, YubiKey authenticator app on mobile, what I would do is go to a site, pull up the app, hit add new, scan the QR code. And then what happens is it doesn't save it into the actual app. It's going to tell you to plug in or tap your key on your device. And mm -hmm. when you do that, it saves all of the information that, that comprises that two-factor code onto your key. Uh, so when you need to retrieve a code for your key, you have to open up the Ubico, uh Authenticator app and tap your key or plug it in and push the button or tap the button. Because I'm like you, I don't think you're really pushing the button. I think you're just kind of resting right. your finger on it for a second. Because it's not, yep. I don't think it physically moves. Uh, I, I don't think it does. Uh, but you do that and then it pulls the data and says, oh, here's the, all the, you know, codes you have on your key, you know, and then you look at the code that you need and then you go type it in. Uh, hmm. So all of that is actually stored on your key. The upside to this is, and this is why I actually tested this was for this reason, went to the Android phone and I had a couple of, mm -hmm. couple of two factor codes that were not in one password because they've been in another app before one password yeah. offered this. Uh, so I did go in and update those uh, and added them to the security key. Also added them to one password, but added them to the security key. Well, I did all this on my iPhone. Pick up the Pixel, install the Yubico Authenticator app, and just tap my key, and there are all my codes. Mm -hmm. Now, that means I could use anybody's phone as long as they're mm -hmm. able to download that app, and they have either NFC or a port that I can plug my key into, uh, and I can retrieve the keys from my YubiKey, uh, which is nice because even if I'm completely, totally, 100% locked out of my phone for some reason, I can't get into anything. Yeah. Like I can retrieve my key, uh, which is super cool uh, because everything's stored on your key. And it's not stored on one device or in a cloud or anything like that. You have the keys to get into your accounts. Yep. Now, if I could figure no out a way, intended. if I could figure out a way to make it store my, uh, you know, that code from one password, your secret code. Yeah. You know, the, 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 whatever they call it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? That, that, that super long ass code that you have to type in. Yeah. If I could get it to store that on my key somewhere, like, man, I would be gravy. I, I would feel super comfortable if I ever had to blow up all my machines or they ever blew up by themselves. And it's like, Oh, how do I get into one password? Well, oh, go here and then go to one password and <laughs> type in your email and plug your key in and then push this button. And it's like, Oh, poof, there's your one password, super secret key. And then type in your password. I would almost, almost, I'm not saying I would, but I would almost buy a one password security key, like physical thing, just to have that, that reassurance. <laughs> What I would actually like, and maybe this is a, a, a suggestion, uh, a, a feature request to ask one password for is like they go because I'm pretty sure they could they could work with Yubico, uh, mm -hmm. which is the company that makes the YubiKeys. Uh, they could work with Yubico and possibly figure out how to make that work in a way. Because, yeah, I, I would feel much better. I'm not going to say I would go out and spend like 70 bucks to buy a brand new key. Uh, from one password, but you know, when it came time to buy a new one or something, like I would be open to having 
that super <laughs> secret key stored on a physical device that nobody is as far as far as we're all aware of is able to go in and just pull data off of. Uh, right. That's the other advantage to a security key and why they're used so heavily in the corporate world is because like you can't just plug it into a computer and browse it or pull data out of it. Like once it's in there, it's in there. Uh, and it must be a totally different standard than regular USB because you can plug a USB port drive into this computer that I have for work. And they're like, ah, no, no, don't even try that. Your admin has disabled this ability, but yet you can plug your UV key in and it, it works just fine. And you don't even have to wait for it to install drivers or anything. So super nice. We promise we won't talk about one password and security keys this entire episode. What, what's going on? You, you got some more info uh, or some more use cases for how you have been adapting your work environment with JAWS and Flexible Web and Hotspots. Yeah, so uh, place markers for JAWS, Hotspots or VoiceOver. <laughs> yep, same difference. Uh, perfectly same difference. So those who don't know, uh, the job that I got working from home is handling customer care inquiries for a semi-major company. And it's, it's uh, fairly... Well known. This has caused me to become more familiar with some uh, web-based ticketing systems that I need to quickly navigate through. I need to be able to quickly navigate through so I can get the information to the customer who needs it as soon as possible. So uh, one of my favorite assistive technology instructors, had uh, Jonathan Mosen, had made mention of Flexible Web a couple of months ago. It might even been a year ago on his podcast. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll check that out one of these days. Well, then when I checked it out, I'm like, oh, this is super nice. I think my previous mention about Flexible Web on the podcast was when I set up some customization for the Google Calendar when I open an event. And then when I got this job, I'm like, man, how can I make it so these three tabs that I will never click on don't show up to me because I only need to get to this first one and the third one, I think it is. And I realized that I could set up flexible web and hide elements on a web page. So I went ahead and did that. And now I literally only see the two tabs that I need on one of these tools that I use. And then the other question that came to mind for me was, how can I, instead of having to press E to get to edit field and make sure I'm in the right edit field when I'm on the phone with someone talking to me in my ear, quickly get to the search field so I can search for items. So I set up a flexible web, um, I, I forget what, customization. I set up a flexible web customization that started reading at the search box that I needed to use to search for a customer by their email or their ticket number, however I need to search for them. It's all the same edit box, but now I don't have to worry about accidentally getting into the second edit box down, which has nothing to do with search fields, uh, if I started pressing E before the web page loaded with JAWS. Uh, so right now I click on the second tab, which is what I need, which normally would be the third link, but because I hid those with flexible web, uh, then jaws plays the little noise that tells me there's customization and my focus is in the edit box and I can start typing what I need to type, hit enter, and then I can press T for table. Or I think now that I'm walking through this, I can set up a second flexible web that will jump me straight to that table. So I don't even have to press T and then I can use table navigation, which is control alt down arrow, left arrow, right arrow, and go to the place in that app that I need to go to, to get the the information that I need. Uh, final thing that I have, have learned to do with JAWS is I'm using place markers a lot more than I had in the past. And that allows me to click on a link, hit a button to jump to, well, hit the letter K to jump to a place marker on that page. And that will take me to the uh, customer's address. So I can verify that information with them when I ask them to please verify your mailing address or your physical address. And then I don't have to do a fine for a address or ADDR to quickly get there. I can just tap the letter K, have that information right in front of me, and I can verify it and then move on with the call because my regular JAWS keystrokes, edits and buttons and C for combo boxes, allow me to navigate around the web. Having those 
little tricks in Jaws, and I know I'm not using it to the best of my ability. Like, I, I presume there's a way to have multiple place markers on one page. Uh, well, I know I can have multiple place markers on one page, but I presume there may be a, a way I can press, like, insert two, which I know will not do it. That switches between words, characters, and, and what that switches your typing echo. But maybe there's a keystroke I can push that will get me to the third place marker on the page, and I can play with that. It all comes down to learning your technology, though, because I've known these features have been available for a while, and I've just never played with them. This puts me then on a on an equal playing field with my sighted colleagues because I can handle an engagement with a customer, whether that be a live chat, an email, or a phone call, and have somewhat of the same response time to that customer and be able to address their concern or their uh, questions with no hesitation because I have all the information I need. Nice. Something I have to realize, and, and it comes down to my... I think it's a blindness thing where you always feel like, or at least I always feel like I have to be able to prove to someone that, yes, I can do this task or yes, my blindness isn't going to be an issue. But uh, I have to remember, I'm still in training, so I'm not expected to have this stuff completely down, even though I feel like I need to have it fully down. <sighs> I think that particular complex is something that, that blind people, uh, a lot of them feel, I'm most certain it doesn't apply to everybody. Uh, but I think a lot of them feel a need to, uh, be able to do more, uh, and not to take the conversation down a, down a, you know, strange path or anything. It's also a lot like that when it comes to, uh, your ethnicity or your race. Uh, you as a minority oftentimes feel the need or feel the pressure to perform, to outperform your counterparts because there's already a strike against you when you walk in the door in a sense. And I think a lot of blind people get that as well because I've always tried to excel at any work that I did, like, you know, yeah. simply because if it comes time to lay people off or fire people like, well, that guy's been excellent. Like, you know, he's been great. <laughs> so we don't want to top him yet. Uh, right. You know, rather than, oh, he causes us a lot of uh, extra work or, or, you know, extra things to be concerned about. There's a lot of concern there with him from a legal side or a or a you know, financial mm. side of purchasing equipment or making adaptions, ad adaptations or modifications. Uh, but he's or he's not as productive as as this one person because it takes him double the right, time to get something done. Right. And I've been like that since I was in school. Like, you know, you took the standard when I took standardized tests in school, like they would always like double. You would get like time mm -hmm. and a half more than what the sighted kids got yep. to finish the test. My goal was to be done before most of the sighted kids was done. Uh, and still passed. Right. Or or at least in an evil in, in an equivalent yeah, time like I wanted is their what time they limit. get. Yeah, I wanted to be done in their time limit at, at minimum. Like that that was the minimum yes. that was acceptable to me was to finish my test in the same amount of time that it would take them to finish their test, not to be sitting there for two and a half hours trying to take a test that they had an hour to take. Uh Sing mm -hmm. crazy, because uh, <laughs> you know, if you give me my stuff in the format I need it in, and, and, and all of that, like I'm good, I can take off. I, I, I can I can be on the same field, the same playing field as what so and so is, like the rest of the mm -hmm. students. So that's all I had in that section. Um, Markdown, Demasi, are you using it still? We talked about it in DM15 back in May of 2017. It's been a while. Man, damn. Yep, I'm still using Markdown. Uh, most of my, I would, in fact, I would actually say at this point, like everything I write is most likely in Markdown. Uh, I and what are you mainly writing it in, or does it? Are are you using it everywhere? Uh, I'm basically using it everywhere except in the random places where it doesn't work. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, like if I write, and then you 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 post a comment and after you wrote it in Markdown, and you realize, oh, this one doesn't like, support oh, it Markdown. Says, hashtag hashtag. It's like, oh, that didn't work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So on the Mac, I'm I'm actually really fluid on the Mac because of uh, 
uh, I use drafts. Draft supports Markdown syntax. So I use mm. drafts a lot. Uh, I haven't used Byword in a while, which I think is an app we we discussed in DM fifteen. Uh, yep. Was Byword yep. for cross platforms. I'm actually using drafts for the majority of anything I write right now. Uh, Can you convert and copy Markdown to rich text with drafts now on the Mac? Uh, I so I can. I don't know if drafts actually supports that directly or not. Yeah. I imagine that there's some way to do it because there's there's been that that drafts action since drafts four on iOS where you yeah. could write something in Markdown and then send it as a rich text email. So it had the links and all of that stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm pretty sure there is a way to do it. So on the Mac, what I actually use for a lot of my Markdown stuff, especially when it comes to doing conversions, is uh, Brett Terpstra's. Uh, Markdown service mm-hmm. tools. And basically all it is yeah. just a bunch of services that you install on the Mac. Uh, pick the ones that you want to use. And I even use it in email, like just from writing an email in the Mac mail out. Like I will write my message in Markdown. I mean, if it's a long message, if it's like a, you know, sure, we can do that or nope, don't do that or hey, wait, stop. Uh, I'll just write. You know, <laughs> just write. But if it's like a long, you know, uh, like I recently wrote an email to someone with some explanations of uh, the work I had just done. Like they paid me to do a thing and I sent them, right. you know, here's what I did. I wrote it all in Markdown. Uh, so I can have my nice bulleted list in the way that I'm comfortable with and headings and all of yep. that. And then, uh, do a command A to select all. And I set the shortcut convert markdown to rich text to control R on the Mac. So ah. automatically converts it to rich text. Uh, some of the other workflows that he has in that, that group of services that you can download and all of them are individual services. So you can install the ones that you choose to use and leave out the ones that you don't. But some other ones, the primary ones from conversion are convert, uh, markdown to rich text, convert markdown to HTML, uh, mm-hmm. which comes in handy in WordPress. Uh, convert HTML to markdown. Yep. Doesn't he have yep. that one? Convert HTML yep. to markdown and convert clipboard to markdown i think is one uh convert html to clipboard uh which means in a lot of cases you can select text in a web page and then be able to have it grab the html source code and convert it to markdown and store it on your clipboard Mm -hmm. uh some of the other ones i use like the star star for bold and, and italic uh i have those mapped to command b for bold and command i so i just select a block of text and hit command i and it's italicized uh and that's anywhere in the operating system. Yeah, anywhere that I can select text or in any yeah in any edit field where you can write text on the Mac that works. Yeah. Uh, here's some really okay. nice linking ones. Uh, so one is just create a new link so you can and you can have it do one of two things. Uh, create a new link will take your highlighted text or highlighted link. It will detect whatever you have selected and then put the appropriate characters around it and then leave the next field blank. So let's say you select a block of text. And uh, run that service. It'll put the brackets around the text and then leave your with blank uh, with empty parentheses to put your link in. It also has one link from clipboard, which is super simple. Uh, you know, you select the text you want to and then you have your link on the clipboard. It automatically maps all that out. Uh, so the linking one that you just mentioned where you select text and then you uh, run that command and it puts the brackets around the text. Is it that one or drafts I'm thinking of that even moves your cursor to the parentheses because it's blank and you can just type in your URL? Uh, I think is this one. I actually don't use that one a ton, but I think it's this uh, one. It could be drafts because uh, drafts yeah. does have a markdown action for making links also. Uh Either way, it's super nice once you get into that workflow because all you have to do is type in the URL and then it's all formatted the correct way. So you move on with your email. Yep. Or or your show notes. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, a couple of the in- any r- interesting ones he has. So he has, uh, and he's recently updated these. So he has a service that will grab all of your Safari tabs in the front most window. Uh Quick side note for people who are confused. Uh, tabs are, think of them like, so your page, a, a, a window in your browser is like a notebook. And all of the tabs that you create inside of that window are all contained within that window. Uh, just thought I would share that. 
for a long time, yeah. I was confused on what the hell a tab in the window was. It's like, wait, am I creating right. a new window in the Why tab? Why would I want to open multiple tabs when I can just open a window? New, yeah, yeah. I, I went yeah. through that too. I was like, why don't I just open a new window? The fuck I need a tab for it? That's stupid. It's extra keystroke. <laughs> extra key within the keystroke to, you know, switch between them. Uh, but he has services that will pull all of the URLs as well as the title text from uh, the frontmost window in Safari and copy all those tabs and dump them out for you. Uh, this He also has one, uh, and again, all separate services. So if you don't use one browser, don't install that service. Uh, but he has one for Safari, Google Chrome. He recently added Microsoft Edge in the Brave browser. Don't use the Brave browser. It sucks and it crashes all the time. Uh on the Mac, can't speak about Windows. Uh, on the Mac, crashes all the time. If you're a voiceover user, just telling you. Uh, if for some reason you are using Brave on the Mac and you are a voiceover user and you don't get random crashes, uh, reach out. Let us know. Go over to yourownpay.com slash DM53 and drop a comment over there or shout out, us, shout out to us on Twitter. I would be interested to compare notes as to what is possibly different in your setup yeah. for mine. Uh, but yeah, nice services there. I have been, uh, so I've kind of really been doing some app simplification. So like I'm not using Ulysses at all. Uh, not using, I don't have ByWord installed on anything at the moment. Uh, I've played around with AI writer, I think is what it's called. Is it AI writer? Yep. Uh, one writer. I am. Uh, use a couple of those, but like I said, most of my writing right now is done in, in drafts and then wherever I need to send it to from there, whether it's email or it's going to a Google Doc or whatever, uh, I, I take it from there and send it where it needs to go. Uh, but what about you, Mike? Because I'm curious. I know when you first switched over to the Mac, like one of the biggest uh, sources of pain for you going back to Windows was not having good markdown editors. So, uh, yeah, that was one of the biggest complaints. One one of the complaints that I had is I can't write Markdown and convert it. There might be ways to do it on Windows, and I need to do some more research into that. For the longest time, what I would do is write Markdown in uh, H. I would write Markdown in Notepad, and there is a Chrome app, and I'm looking up the name of it right now, called Minimalist Markdown App that I would use, and I'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, I wrote down a note so I can remember it. But I would grab my Markdown, and I would paste it into that Minimalist Markdown app, and it would give me an opportunity to copy the rich text or to copy HTML. Uh, and then I'd paste that wherever I needed it. And that's a little convoluted. I was super happy when I'd find a form or, or a place where I could comment that says Markdown is supported. Uh, Reddit is a big one that I've been using a lot. And in there, you can use their Fancy Pants editor, I think is what they call it, which is the visual editor. Or you can switch to the basic Markdown editor. So I often switch to the Markdown editor. And then I've got some templates in Markdown uh, saved in text expander so there's a subreddit that is slash r slash podcast and in there on a weekly basis you can post your podcast latest podcast episodes they want it in a specific format so i went ahead and built that out in markdown and notepad on the format that they wanted with all the links and everything and then i copied that over to text expander and i pasted the um, markdown into text expander assigned it to a snippet and then whenever i need to post a weekly episode i will punch in the uh, code to expand that it gives me the dynamic uh options it says what episode is this what's the episode title and i hit okay and all oh and then ask for the summary of the episode two that i copy from when i'm posting it and i paste that in there and then i hit okay and it's got a, a perfectly formatted markdown block that i can post on reddit and it goes live so that's good and then i was listening to the most an explosion podcast uh this most recent wednesday i think it was when he was talking about pinecast and jonathan mentioned how in episode 48 he shared a uh, microsoft word plugin that he's using called uh 
called Right Edge. And I'm like, okay, well, that sounds very intriguing. How does that work? And what you can do with Right Edge is you install it and it goes into your Microsoft Word categories or it goes into your Microsoft Word application. So you can write uh, Markdown in Notepad, save it as a .md file, and then if you open it in Microsoft Word, it shows you with all the edits that you made. Now, if you make uh, edits in Microsoft Word, so for example, you add a link or you add something to your bolded list, then you save the file as a .md, it will save all of your visual formatting as a Markdown file. So then you can open that in Notepad or in any other Markdown editor, and and take a look at how that was changed. And and that's kind of altered, like, over the last couple of days, my markdown processes on Windows, because I'm like, man, I can just type up something in Notepad in Markdown, save it as an MD file, and then get all the visual RTF uh, formatting of it from the Word uh uh, from Microsoft Word. Another thing that Rightage will do is when you save a Markdown file or a .md file and you press enter on that, instead of it asking you, instead of Windows asking you what for what app you want to open this file in, it has caused the association to be .md files will open in Microsoft Word. So you open it in Microsoft Word and you can make your changes and then save that and then either open it in Notepad or move it to somewhere else where you need it. So Right now, those two minimal, minimalist Markdown Editor, a Chrome app, and I got that when I was using a Chromebook because I wanted Markdown functionality in the Chromebook, and the writage for Microsoft Word are the two ways that I am working with um, Markdown on Windows. Cool. That, that, uh, it's interesting that that, that, uh, that tool exists for the add on exists for Microsoft Word. That's not something I would have expected to see. Right. Me neither. And when he mentioned, I'm like, ah, I got My initial thought was, oh, that's not going to be accessible, but it, it, it's not, not accessible. So I am playing with it. Uh, you can create tables in Microsoft Word and it saves the markdown formatting for that. So that is, that is interesting as well. I have not found something on, Android for Markdown. Now, that is not to say that it doesn't exist because I haven't looked for it, but I will be doing some research into that because I see mobiles here on the show notes. Uh, I, I presume you're just using drafts on iOS for Markdown? Pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, mostly, I'm going to be honest, like I don't do anywhere near the amount of writing that I used to do on my iPhone. Uh, that I have done in the past. So uh, that's one reason like, you know, drafts works because it's cross platform. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, I don't have to worry about some random app. I have again, like I said, and I, that's actually where I played with, uh, was it AI writer? Uh, yeah. Or, IA yeah. writer. One of them. We'll get it right in the show notes. It'll be there. Uh, <laughs> in one writer, which are all apps I bought at some point in the past. Uh, I don't use them, but I did, you know, play around with them for a little while. It's like, I really don't do that much writing on iOS. I don't have an iPad. So, uh, that's the only place I could possibly foresee me doing a ton of writing, uh, where I would need maybe something other than drafts, uh, for that. Uh, but yeah, I was curious, had you, had you encountered or found anything or tried out anything on Android, uh, that lets you write Markdown? I know we have both, uh, accident, sort of accidentally, or at least in my case, at least I know for certain it was accidentally figured out what Google Docs will support in Markdown format and what it won't. Uh, <laughs> Google, if you're listening to this podcast, it would be nice to be able to just paste it. And uh, speaking of that, actually, Andrew, while I was learning about um, uh, Right Edge, Andrew goes, well, can you use Markdown in Google Chrome? And I'm like, nah, not or in Google Docs. I'm like, eh, not, not really. I mean, you kind of can. But then I jumped into a new Google tab because that's what I do when I'm curious. And I said, can you use Markdown in Google Docs? And apparently there's an add-on to Google Docs that will let you use Markdown. So I'm going to check into that a little bit. Uh, we should look at that. Although I remember 
there was something, and maybe it's not the same thing we're thinking about, because maybe this wasn't a, it was not a Google Doc at all, I don't think. It was something else. Remember we were looking for, I, I remember what I was looking at, so no, this is probably not the same thing. Uh, this add-on you're talking about is probably not the same thing. We were looking for a way to be able to take your Google Doc and automatically uh, use it to publish to WordPress is what I was looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. And there was some weird add on that did that. And I was like, eh, you know, I don't, that looks a little fishy. Don't think you need all that access <laughs> to my WordPress site. I'm cool. Moving on. Right. Uh, and it's Mike pointed out to me, you can paste a Microsoft Word document, which you could also export your Google Doc as a Microsoft Word document. Uh, you can paste a Microsoft Word doc into the block editor in WordPress and all of the formatting sticks. You can do the same thing with a Google Doc Doc too. Just so ah, you know. okay, so you don't even have to do a conversion; just select and paste. No, ah, nice. Yep. yep. Uh, and man, that Alt slash—I think it's Command slash on Windows or on Mac. It might be. Uh, I, anyways, Alt slash on Windows. Demosi can figure out what it is on the Mac to get you into the menu search option for Google Docs is super handy. Like. I can type in bullet in that search and hey, look, I've got bolded lists. Uh, Demasi may have noticed that I've been using bolded lists with the Google Doc lately. So, yeah. Yeah. So, see, that's one of those things I accidentally discovered where I just hit a dash and space. And when I hit return, it turns that dash into a bullet and I've started a bulleted list. Wait, really? Yeah. You didn't know that? I thought we discussed this. Hold on. I think we Hold did. On, I'm do it down here, or you can do it anywhere. But it does. Um, for some reason, it keeps the dash there, though. Unless that's how they're formatted, because Jaws says dash bullet. Ah, uh, maybe it's making a weird. And then we hit enter. Star. It says dash bullet blank. I will try that. It works with star yeah, also. See, it is a test. Boom. Yeah, dash bullet star. Oh, probably because I forgot to delete the Yeah, dash. I was going to say, delete the first <laughs> bullet first, then just type a star, and as soon as you hit space, it says bullet list created. Right. That is super cool. See, we learn something new every day. Yeah, so I, I've never... What I learned... It is command slash on the Mac also to get to that that, that uh, search. Uh, help, help. Show what I list. learned in Word is if you hit Alt-Q, that'll put you in the search to search the menu bar for Word. You type in bullet and you hit enter and that starts a bolded list. You type what you want to type, then you press enter and it puts another bullet. But if you press tab, then it puts a, a nested list there. And then you type your, your additional content and you press enter and you're still in the nested list. But if you press shift tab uh, at the beginning of that line, it'll take you back to the main list. Ah, so, so uh, I don't know if Docs does that or not. Because uh, I made so I don't know docs, either. I don't remember exactly what I did to make it. There are several markdown markdown editors on the Mac that give you like similar functionality. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're typing along in markdown using your stars or your dashes or whatever. You hit return and it creates a new dash and puts the space there. Uh, and with, uh, I believe it was multi markdown composer is the app I was using. If you if you hit tab, it will automatically just indent that bullet list and keep you on that level. So some cool editors out there uh some features are i'm slightly surprised to hear that they're in word although it makes sense <laughs> makes sense it's just like oh, i wouldn't expect that to be there uh but there are some pretty right. fully featured uh markdown editors on mac os uh, ios i hear people love these you know the ia writers and the one writers and all of that i have i just don't really have that much need to use them on ios and i'm, I'm kind of cool where i'm at the mac i don't really feel the need to buy a new app because i can write everything i want in drafts and then just go you know if i need a word doc i can go to pages and you know paste it in and export it as a word doc although that's weird mm -hmm. uh <laughs> But yeah, I like the trick though with the whole pasting into a uh, WordPress. That that has led me to investigate the block editor a lot more, just because it's like, well, hey, that can make the publishing workflow for somebody who's not super familiar with WordPress simpler, especially if they're already writing their stuff in Microsoft Word in the first place. Just hey, select all your text, go over here, create new post, paste, and uh, you're good. Now I need. Yeah, that is. 
I was going to ask, like, do you, uh, I was going to make a statement, but what I'm going to ask you instead is, uh, does you just do that in a blank, uh, post or page? Like, you don't have to have, like, you don't, there's no point in creating a block first. Just go to the, the, the new block field, the little slash where it says, you know, yeah, yep. and then just paste and then everything plops out the way it's supposed to. Yep. And then you can get, you can tap escape on Windows. That'll put you in the block navigation mode. You can navigate blocks. You can cut a paragraph, which is a block and paste it somewhere else if you want it or move things around or, or format it. So, um, but it will keep the formatting that you have. So if you have, list have a heading a headings, level three or a list yeah, or that's something, what I found Word, fascinating it'll, uh, about yeah. it. So, that actually solves, and I think I mentioned this to you on a message a few days ago. I was like, man, you must be omniscient or something. Because it's like the second time you have <laughs> said a thing and it's like, oh, well, you know, actually, Mike is right about that. I, can, I don't even remember what the first thing was now. Uh, yeah. But I was like, man, so turns out uh, this young lady uses Microsoft Word. So, hey, one, I don't have to go through what I had started working on, which is building out a block uh, template for posts. That would always appear when she got ready to create a new post, like you hit new posts and you automatically get certain fields that are there. Uh, that's not necessary because all she has to do is copy out a word, go paste, and it'll take care of all of mm-hmm. that. Uh, and I don't really have to spend a ton of time up front before I hand the project over doing a lot of documentation or, or tutorials on using the block editor and what all these different blocks mean. Just paste your crap in teach her how to navigate around uh, and make tweaks, but you know, I don't have to spend that as, as much time. And I think that makes, uh, I think that that will make things a lot simpler for her, but it also makes things simpler for me on the development side, because my solution to keep the block editor from being too overwhelming was to create a template that would uh, show up whenever she created a new post. And it's like, well, your title's already there. Uh, here's your, secondary headline if you don't want to put anything there then just skip it and therefore it won't put that that next heading mm-hmm. you know and just do things like that and basically lay out a bunch of paragraph blocks uh see and you and i both know someone else who's very familiar with microsoft word and and maybe we can use this knowledge to help her get more into posting content on different places with uh, the wordpress block editor as well mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. So the little things that add up pretty quickly that can help a lot of people. Um, uh, I was going to say something. Oh, I don't know how images work from Microsoft Word. So if you had an image in a document and you copy that whole document, if that image will upload to the media library or what happens, I suspect it will not, but it is something I will play around with with Andrew because that's the only thing that I'm, I'm not quite sure about. Hmm. Yeah, but it's not that difficult to add an image no. block. Nope. Just slash and then go down to image or video or audio. I really like this block editor. <laughs> so you don't have to leave the WordPress post. You can just add the content that you need. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I like the idea, kind of like of what they wanted to do with it when it first came out. It's just the accessibility was so horrible. And unlike you, I yeah. didn't go back and start poking at it uh, until here recently, simply because it was just easier to do what I was doing. Uh, most of my WordPress, most of the time I actually get inside of WordPress is either uh, writing and testing code to like, hey, I wrote this thing and I want this to show up like this. Hey, it worked or no, it didn't work or <laughs> shit. I got the white screen. I don't know what I did. I must have right. dropped a comma somewhere. Oh shit. Uh, so I don't get, you know, like I'm not actually, I tell people like I don't spend a ton of time publishing anything in WordPress anymore, uh, which needs to change. As soon, and I do mean this, I know I've said this before, but Mike knows, you know, kind of behind the scenes a little bit that I have been working on uh, things, uh, but I do mm-hmm. intend on getting back to blogging and getting my blog back up. Uh, it's just, you know, man, life shit keeps popping up and it's like, oh, I got to gotta slay this dragon first before i can go over there and deal with that one hey you blogging dragon you just hang out over there for a second not your it's not your <laughs> turn buddy this guy's bigger than you or this guy has right. money so uh yeah you hang out over there because that's 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 the big one this this one has this guy money. has an envelope in his talent so i'm gonna see what he wants first so i want to wrap things up with a quick tip 
that I got from Blind Bargains, and we will link to the podcast episode that I got it from, because I don't remember the number, and Demasi, I think, will appreciate this. So, a couple, several episodes ago, I mentioned how I'm using virtual desktops on Windows. Now, for those who don't remember, you can... Go to your desktop and press Control Windows D, and that will create a new desktop on Windows. And then whatever you open, so in the second desktop, I can have the soft phone that I use for work, and in the first desktop, I have Google Chrome open. So when I'm alt-tabbing, I only have the soft phone and notepad in the second one to keep notes, and when I'm in the first desktop, I only have Google Chrome. I've been doing that for, well, since I was taking live chats for Kindercare, so 2017. And it's been great. Your, uh, your, when you press Windows D, you hear desktop one or desktop two, and you know what's on each of those desktops. Well, in the latest version of Windows 10, what you can do is you can press Control Windows D and get into desktop two. Hold Windows and tap Tab, which brings up a very interesting, I'm trying to get the name of it right now, they call it the Task View, and that gives you some awesome information. Uh, it's gone into more details in the podcast. We'll link to it, youronpay.com slash dm53. But for example, you can get, uh, yesterday I had a notepad document open called IP meals. And then on August 6, I had a notepad document called IP meals open. Um, and on August 5th, it says that I had Microsoft edge getting windows 10 help open. Uh, and so I, you can go back into the history of the different things that you have open or look at what you have open right now. For example, I have the DM Google Doc open, and then I've got uh, some other icons open as well. But if you shift tab, then you have a list box that says virtual desktops list view. So I see that I have desktop two here. I can press the add new desktop button, which will allow me to add another desktop. And then I have something at the top that says personal. And if I tap enter on personal and then I re press windows D to get to my desktop and I read my title bar, it says personal. So what you can do in this windows tab, uh, running applications task view is I can go over here to desktop two, tap the F2 key, which puts you in the rename field, delete the desktop two out of there and call this business, for example. And then when you press enter to save it and you jump over to desktop two, then you hear JAWS when you do an insert T say business. Now that, that at first, like I was like, wow, that, that helps me stay organized. It's a little thing, but it helps me stay organized but that also will keep if you reboot your computer so that's even better because you i can reboot my computer and then i'll have my personal desktop on the left and my business desktop on the right and you can have i think i want to say it's 900 desktops not that i would need that many but because now i can rename them it might be something i'd be open to exploring and then i wouldn't have to press windows left and right arrow control windows left and right arrow to get through each of them i can tap windows t and then use first First letter navigation in the desktop screen or desktop list to be able to jump to whichever desktop I want. So I just wanted to share that with people because I heard that and I'm like, I got to try that out. That is cool. So I'm using it now like everywhere. I still want the ability on the Mac. And if anybody listening knows how to do (laughs) this too. Uh, be able to lock your command tab to a specific uh, workspace on Mac OS. So as Mike uh-huh. just described, like he's got, uh, you know, the soft phone and notepad open and desktop too, uh, which will be space to, you know, on the Mac. Uh, he hits command tab. Well, the only thing he's going to flip through is uh, the soft phone application and notepad. It's not going to take him into desktop one and offer him the ability to open up Chrome over there, mm-hmm. uh, which is what happens on the Mac. Uh, so I cannot, I can have multiple instances like, you know, a window of Safari here in, de- in space one and another one in space three. But I can never be certain where I'm going to land at if I'm in space three (laughs) and I got, you know, Safari and a Safari window and uh, 
Nova, which is a text editor coming from Panic at some point in the near future. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know when. I would tell you if I knew when. I don't know when. Uh, so all I can say about it is Nova is working on an updated text editor for anybody. Uh, I mean, excuse me, Panic, Panic is working on a new text editor called Nova to replace uh, whatever the hell that text editor was that I didn't like. Coda, Coda was the app. Uh, mm. So that's coming. It's nice. I like it. Uh, but you could have those in space. Yeah, 3. I can have those in space three. Uh, but also have a window for Safari open in space one that has, you know, the Google Meet, you know, running or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm in space three and I'm in Nova and I hit command tab and uh, it says finder and I hit command tab again and it says Safari. But it may take me to the Safari that's in space one instead of the window in space <laughs> three. Because you know what? If I would hit command shift tab when I was in Nova, it would have taken me back to the Safari window that was in space three. Very weird. I would like to be locked, have the ability to turn it on or fix it so that it locks me to a space because that is the reason I play around with spaces and then stop because I oftentimes find myself in the wrong space with the wrong window open because I have an application and I know some people are going to say you don't have to email me or write well you can't email me Uh, (laughs) 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 you don't have to tweet me or drop a comment on the site wait we got comments on I can't remember I don't don't know know. (laughs) Uh, you don't have to tweet me and say uh, or, you know, mention Michael on Facebook and tell him to tell me uh, that, hey, what you should do is put your Safari in one space and put Nova in Chrome in another space and put Transmit in the terminal in a third space and then don't have Windows from another application, uh, from one application in multiple spaces. That's great. I like it. Keep your suggestion to yourself, right? I tried that. I don't <laughs> like it because it's not the way I'm trying to work. Uh, well, and not only that, but it doesn't solve the issue because if you command tab enough, you're going to get back into one of those other spaces and that defeats the whole purpose. Yeah, of I it. mean, it would solve the problem. Like if I hear Safari come up in the switcher, like before I yeah. let it go, then I know, okay, well, no, I'm not where I want to be. Like, oh, I know what two apps are in this space, so I only want to, but it still doesn't. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't solve the problem in actuality because. I could still end up in a situation where I'm hitting command tab five times before I actually get to the app that is right next to the app that I just yep. left in the same workspace, uh, which is the problem I have. Yes. Uh, so very jealous of the whole virtual desktops and the way that they're configured. It is a possibility on the Mac, but I'm, I'm jealous of the, the, the way that they are configured uh, on Windows. Uh, not quite enough to go switch over to Windows because there would be that <laughs> whole problem of like, well, you know, now there's no there's no Nova or transmit or I can replace those apps. Probably well, uh, no terminal though. I am going to, I am going to throw this suggestion out there to you and uh terminal would be windows PowerShell. Oh geez. But then uh, I got to learn see. PowerShell <laughs> techniques, dude. Like no, no, my PowerShell uh, game you... is so man. So I use PowerShell back in XP, right? But uh, PowerShell yeah. is different enough from the way that mm. Mac OS and yep. Linux behave that like, yeah, I would actually have to learn it. Mm. And and it's a huge rabbit hole that you would fall down when you started mm-hmm. Googling it. Been there, done that, don't want to do it again. Uh, what I was going to say, though, is you do, uh, for the time being, still have a Intel-based Mac. You could experiment with VMware, but then that kind of defeats the whole purpose because... Yeah, it's like, oh, I got you're going into I, VMware I got to Chrome. make virtual desktops. I got Chrome open in a virtual desktop over here in VMware, but now I need to go <laughs> into my text editor that's back over here on the back. Ah, yeah, that, that's all. I do need to yeah, play with yeah, VMware. No. I have not played with it for a while uh, to see what has improved. There are some possibilities that I will want to use it in the future uh, for a few mm-hmm. things. I, I need to kind of stay more up to date with Windows 10. Uh, or for nothing yeah, else, just to, just the experience of it. Uh, Get on Windows 10 on VMware and just use Narrator. We are going to wrap this show up. I think I shared my tip earlier about uh, something cool, which was the Yubico Authenticator app. Uh, get a YubiKey. We'll probably revisit this topic at some point in the future. I, I have a feeling, very strong feeling, that Mike is going to wind up buying his own uh, YubiKey. 
Uh, I have a feeling you might be right after I get a new microphone, which we will have for the next episode at yourownpay.com slash DM53. There will also be a mailing list there when you're hearing this episode, a mailing list opt-in. Go over there because I am sharing with my mailing list what's coming up on the Kelly Co. show, and there's some exciting news about Kelly Co. that I can share with people here very soon. So, Also, another reason to sign up is that at some point in the future, we're going to sit down and figure out a quick automated way to give you all of the links in email so that you uh, don't necessarily have to go over yes. the DM. Uh, but you got to go over there now if you want to get on the mailing list. So your own pay dot com exactly. DM 53 uh, is where you can find that form. Uh, oh, I do have a tip to leave you with. Host Gator, stay the hell away from it. <laughs> By all means, site ground. Uh, decent place to go. We'll drop a link to site ground in the show notes. Uh, He's on Twitter. It will be a referral link. D. <laughs> Just so you know, it will be a referral link, but it's not why I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you because site ground is hella better than Host Gator. Just saying. Yes. Uh, anyhow, yeah, I'm on Twitter, D A M A S H E. I'm there most of the time. Sometimes, well, look, if you at mention me, I will eventually see it at some point the day that you at mention me because I do have the Twitter <laughs> app on my phone and I do get notifications when people mention me or like a tweet that I posted. Uh, thank you for a few people who liked the one password tweet uh, that were not named Michael Babcock because, of course, he's going to like it. He was in the show. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 He is on. And I'm at Payo. P A Y O W N. Follow him, tweet at him. He's always in Twitter all the time, even when he's supposed to be working. He's got yeah. that fourth workspace Shh. that has a uh, uh, chicken nugget. T W Blue. Oh, uh, wait, wasn't that app called Chicken <laughs> Nugget at some point though? That that was it. There was so T W Blue is the open source version. Uh, Christopher Toft, I think it yep. is, wrote an app called Chicken Nugget. That both of them look very familiar, but T W Blue is free. Uh, Chicken Nugget was free when I was using. It. I never paid for it. Oh no, it's like twenty bucks. Uh, now. Well, I guess you figured people keep using it. You needed to make some money, but Chicken Nugget was an interesting yeah. Twitter app. It didn't have an actual visual interface at the time that I used it. Uh, See, and TW Blue does have a visual <laughs> interface, but you can hide it. Uh, yeah, there was no visual. So this is a long time. There was no yeah. visual interface to Chicken Nugget when I was using it. I don't know what's changed about it now, obviously, because uh, I didn't even know if it was still out there. But yeah, it was an interesting yep. way to use Twitter. And you could use Twitter from just about anywhere on Windows because uh-huh. there were just specific commands you would hit to say, you know, new tweet or read my tweets or uh it was yep. it was nice. Uh it was the A lady can read your tweets. I learned that. Oh the man, other day. nobody give a shit about that A lady. <laughs> I don't want her reading nothing. Now you're just giving her more data. See, now she's reading your tweets, but then she's also storing your tweets is what you don't know. Oh, of course. Of course. Now they know. <laughs> that's why she's not reading my tweets. Oh, uh, that's why. Uh-huh. <laughs> and see, but, but, but then again, if she was reading your tweets, Mike, maybe she would hear about the DM show and then Amazon would reach out and be like, well, hey, we noticed you don't have your podcast in here so that we can say, hey, uh, uh a lady. Almost said it. Hey, a hey, lady, play uh, the DM show. You should, you should talk with us and get that set up. Wait, do we have that set up? Can you do that? Uh, you can say play the Your Own Pay podcast network, but I don't know if we can do the DM show. Guess what? I'm going to go do when we wrap this up. Uh, yeah, that's coming to them too. Yeah, everybody just say, hey, go play the DM show. Oh, I should make a skill so they can open the skill. And get a list of all of the shows and just say the name of the show. Mm. And then they can leave us voicemail feedback. Wait a minute. Hold on. Voicemail. <laughs> we should yeah, set that can, up at some you point. Can, you can set up a voicemail. You, people can call 541 uh, Oh, my God. I almost gave him Nicholas. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. He would not be happy about that. <laughs> He, Bunch of people. He, he came to me the other day and he goes, Dad, this this person called me and it says likely spam. And I just ignored it. I'm like, yeah, that's what I do when it says that to me, too. Yeah, that's the thing to do. Yeah, no, don't give out Nicholas' phone number. Don't try to give out the number. We don't have a number. There's no number for you to call. It doesn't exist. You're gonna have, I have a Google voice phone number somewhere, but I don't remember. I'm have him calling Nicholas. And he's going to like, man, why are people calling to yell at me telling me I'm wrong about how spaces work? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> All right, yourownpay.com slash DM53. <laughs> <laughs> 
You've been listening to Your Own Pay Podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, visit yourownpay.com slash cast for exclusive content and to contact us today. We're eager to hear your thoughts and about how you're making this podcast your own. Thanks for listening. We'll be back soon. The Your Own Pay Podcast, yourownpay.com.